Let me ask you a rather simple question. Are you really thinking for yourself, making your own decisions? You might be surprised to find out there are people who say you're not. And that's today's episode of Authentic. Let me ask you what amounts to being a very strange question. Did you consciously choose to listen to this show today, or did something or somebody else make that decision for you? And I know it kind of rubs our fur the wrong way when somebody suggests that you and I are not actually in control of our brains, our lives, not actually making free will decisions. But you know, there's a, a growing body of belief, a rising number of people who actually believe that your sense of free will is nothing but an illusion. You only think that you're making decisions when in fact you're not. And again, I know, the evidence of your senses does not agree with that idea. You consciously made the decision to download this podcast, didn't you? You consciously made the decision to slip in your earbuds or sit on the front porch and listen to this on the radio, and you know for sure that you decided that stuff. It's as obvious as the nose on your face. But you know, a number of very intelligent people don't think that's true. They think that the decisions you make are predetermined. They're actually caused by the events that came before this moment. And while you think you made a conscious choice, it was actually the events of your past that determined what you're going to do right now. And because your brain cannot possibly assess all of the data all of the time, there will always be a lot of influences that you're just not aware of. For example, let's suppose you want to go shopping for a new sweater and you pick out a dark red V-neck like the one I'm wearing and you leave the other colors behind on the rack. Your brain is telling you you deliberately chose that color and you might even be able to explain why you chose it. It goes with the pants that you plan to wear or it's Christmas time and you wanted something red or Maybe red reminds you of your dad's old car and that gives you happy memories. But can you really assess every bit of data that went into making that decision? Back in 2011, the author Sean Nichols published a piece in Scientific American dealing with the issue of free will. And he describes the problem like this. He writes, imagine a universe in which everything that happens is completely caused by whatever happened before it. So what happened in the beginning of the universe caused what happened next and so on right up to the present. If John decided to have french fries at lunch one day, this decision, like all others, was caused by what happened before it. Now, of course, that seems completely ridiculous. Of course John made a conscious decision to eat french fries, and of course we're in charge of our lives. We might not be able to choose what happens to us over the course of a lifetime, but we can certainly choose how to respond. Or can we? Not according to some people. Back in 2003, Benjamin Libet accepted a major prize for his work in neuroscience. And what he discovered was that when you decide to do something, the brain actually fires a few hundred milliseconds before you became aware of making that decision. So in other words, it looks like your neural network is making the decision before you do, and you only think you willfully did it. Of course, if that's true, the implications are staggering. It would mean that you're acting subconsciously all the time. Of course, his findings raised a lot of eyebrows because it runs completely contrary to everything we think we know, and it creates a problem when it comes to holding people accountable. After all, you can't really discipline a wayward employee if he or she isn't actually choosing to misbehave. And how do you sentence a murderer to life in prison if he didn't actually have a choice in the matter? Naturally, the theory has a lot of critics, and some people have pointed out that the equipment Libet was using for that experiment might have created the impression that the subconscious brain fires first. And it might just be the case that we can't actually measure precisely what happens when. It all comes down to the equipment you use 
and its ability to capture accurate data in real time. Given the limits of our understanding about brain science, it may just seem to us that subconscious decisions happen before you think about them. And you've also got to ask yourself, what else aren't we seeing? Because while we monitor certain activities with our scientific equipment, it's entirely possible that we're missing processes that we know nothing about. We're not even looking for them. Now, personally, I think the real problem that I have with this idea is that it seems to fly in the face of everyday human experience. I mean, everything we have ever known about what it means to be human involves the idea of conscious choice. Of course, that doesn't mean we've been right all this time, because sometimes what science reveals ends up being stranger than fiction. For example, consider the now famous double slit experiment, which I'm sure you heard about in high school, at least if you were paying attention. It's that experiment where light passes through two small slits and creates an interference pattern on the surface behind it. It's exactly what you'd expect, and it's kind of like dropping two stones in a pond and watching the ripples start to overlap. The valleys and peaks of those tiny little waves begin to cancel each other out, and they create a distinctive and recognizable pattern. And shining a normal light through those two slits produces exactly the same pattern. So, of course, that leads most people to think of light as a wave, and in many ways that's exactly what light is. But then let's assume also that light is a particle, which is also true. And we've got a special gun, let's say, that fires just one light particle at a time through those two slits. But then we'll block off one of those slits, meaning that we only have one. So what do you get? Well, you get what you'd expect a bunch of impact points on the walls behind the slit where those light particles are landing. But then open up the second slit and you get something really weird. Even though you're only firing one light particle at a time, you still get an interference pattern. It's as if the individual particles are passing through both slits at the very same time. So in other words, the behavior of light at the atomic level in the microcosm isn't what we expect. It's a complete mystery because now the universe appears to have one set of physical principles up here at the big level, but then apparently another set of rules for the world of tiny particles. So welcome to the wonderful world of quantum mechanics where particles appear to change behavior if we watch them, and where particles separated by vast distances seem to be able to communicate with each other at speeds faster than that of light. It defies our expectations. So, the idea that free will must exist because it seems obvious, well, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the way the universe actually is. But still, I'm going to mount a bit of a protest because the idea that we have absolutely no freedom, no real moral agency, well, it undermines everything we know about what it means to be authentically human. And now, I'm going to make a conscious decision to take a quick break so that you can take advantage of some really amazing resources from the good people at The Voice of Prophecy. I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. The idea that you and I have no free will is often called determinism, as in all your actions are already determined for you, even if you think you're making conscious decisions. And maybe one of the most significant names when it comes to deterministic thinking is the Dutch Jewish philosopher Baruch Spinoza, a man who lived and wrote during the 17th century. He was descended from a long line of Portuguese Jews. And of course, by the time we get to the 15 and 1600s, a lot of Jews from the south of Europe were looking for a new place to live because of the Inquisition. So it's no surprise that a man like Spinoza was born in Amsterdam because in the 17th century, the Dutch Republic was about the most tolerant society in Western Europe. In fact, 
a lot of the English dissenters, and we've talked about them on other shows, a lot of English dissenters who were being persecuted for their beliefs in England were also living in the Netherlands, including people like John Locke and the Pilgrims and other people who left England to find just a little bit of intellectual freedom. But of course, even though the Netherlands was famously tolerant and honestly an inspiration to other people longing for freedom, in spite of that, Spinoza experienced more than a bit of trouble when his synagogue in Amsterdam rejected his ideas and excommunicated him back in 1654. From that point on, he had to earn his living as a lens grinder, which likely led to his early death at 45 because of all the dust from glass that he inhaled on the job. And why was Spinoza excommunicated? It was because of his views of the universe. Spinoza didn't believe in a personal God, but identified God with nature itself, a way of thinking about the universe that we often call pantheism, as in God is everything and everything is God. Spinoza often referred to something he called the God of nature, and what he meant by that is an immovable underlying reality behind the universe. God, he said, was the substance of the universe, and he used that word quite deliberately because substance means that which stands underneath. Everything around us, Spinoza taught, is just a mode of the ultimate reality, and that would include you and me. We are just seemingly individual expressions of that ultimate substance, but our individuality, he argued, is really an illusion. Of course, that perspective was decidedly unwelcome at the synagogue because both Orthodox Christians and Jews insisted that God is not identical with the material universe. The Bible teaches that God is transcendent and personal. He exists in His own right, quite apart from the creation. But that's not what Spinoza believed, and so the synagogue became worried that their otherwise tolerant Christian neighbors and charitable Dutch hosts might actually turn against them. So, they offered to pay Spinoza an annual salary to keep his mouth shut, but when they failed to secure his cooperation, they just kicked him out of the synagogue. Now, if you actually want to read Spinoza's philosophy, you're going to have to set aside a little bit of time, especially if you want to read The Ethics, which is easily his most important work. Not only is this really dense material that will demand a lot of your attention, it's also written in a mathematical style, as if philosophy can be discussed with geometric precision. In the spirit of the famous mathematician Euclid, Spinoza's philosophy was presented as a series of definitions, axioms, and proofs. So, it's not exactly a relaxing read, but it has been influential enough that it's probably important to make a note of his basic ideas and what they imply about the nature of human free will. Basically, Spinoza didn't believe that free will exists. He said that the universe is based on an immutable law, the law of nature, which he also referred to as God in a very impersonal sense. He taught that you and I are just being carried along without any real freedom to choose. This is really the ultimate work of determinism. And if it wasn't such brutally tedious reading, I'd be tempted to read a little bit of this to you. But I think I'll spare you the boredom and try to give you a thumbnail sketch of what it says. In essence, Spinoza believed that everything that is and everything that happens, well, everything's exactly the way that it's supposed to be and there's nothing you can do to change that. The law of nature is simply the law of nature and there's nothing you can do to fight against that. The best we can do is understand our place in the world and harmonize our thinking with the law of nature if we want to find greater happiness. The idea that we can actually make choices, though, well, Spinoza said that's not possible, except for the matter of how we choose to think about life. Now, to help make sense of this, we should probably make a note of the fact that lots of other prominent thinkers were saying there's a fundamental difference between your mind and your body. There are two separate and distinct realms, which are the physical and the spiritual. But Spinoza said those two things are the same. Your mind is your body, and your body is your mind. And then he suggested the same thing was true about God. He said that the universe was actually God's body, which is one of the ideas that got him excommunicated. 
All we can hope to do, Spinoza argued, is find a little bit of happiness by better understanding the nature of the universe and then aligning ourselves with that nature. Whatever happened in the past was predetermined, he said, and whatever happens in the future is also predetermined. You and I are just part of this mathematically precise machine, and that will never change. You are not free to change things, and everything you experience is the product of unseen causes that drive you. You are, to put it simply, a puppet of the universe. It's the same thing that some psychologists are saying today. You and I don't really have free will, they suggest. It just seems like we do. We might think we make conscious decisions, but we're never completely aware of all the unseen causes that lead us to make those decisions. Your genetics play a role, your past experience plays a role, your biology plays a role, and you're mostly unaware of those influences. Most of the time, ideas just seem to pop into your head, but you'd be at a loss to explain why you got those ideas and exactly where they came from. It's determinism, and it leads to a serious moral problem if you're going to choose to believe that it's true. Because if there is no free will, no real moral agency, then how in the world can you hope to hold other people responsible for their actions? That's a question worth exploring, because to some extent there is some truth to what these people are saying. You and I aren't even remotely aware of what our brains are doing at any given moment, and we do operate on autopilot an awful lot of the time. Most of the things you do every single day do not require you to think about them. For example, you don't make a conscious decision to breathe, although you could do that if you wanted to. And you don't make a decision to digest your food or blink your eyes. Those things just happen automatically, and that's a good thing, because if you did have to make a conscious decision about every little thing your body does right down to the cellular level, well, that would make a mess of you, and you'd be incapable of actually living. So instead, most of what we do happens in the background of our brains, leaving us free to make decisions about the big stuff, the stuff that goes into living an authentic human life. Now, what determinists will tell you is that your conscious decisions are also happening on autopilot and you're being deceived into thinking that you're making those decisions. But that's exactly where the determinists and the Bible part company. What I find in the Bible appears to be a more realistic view of human moral agency. It seems to match our actual experience better than this idea that we're all just puppets having our strings pulled involuntarily. And the Bible does agree that a lot of what you choose to do in this life is the product not of deliberate rational thought, but of unseen influences taking place in the background. Let me show you what I mean now from the words of Jesus, where he says, For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. In other words, there are subconscious autonomic processes that drive you to do the things that you do and to say the things that you say. But at the same time, the Bible still makes us responsible for our behavior. Why? Because we're the ones who program those automatic responses in the first place. All right, I've got to take another quick break, but I'll be right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. The determinists tell us that the physical universe predetermines how you think, that your thoughts are really a product of who or what you are. And to a tiny little degree, in some ways, the Bible kind of agrees with that. But it also presents the opposite point of view. It says that you and I become what we think. For example, Proverbs 23, verse 7 tells us, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, how you choose to think ultimately changes who you are. And over the long run, that can lead to changes in your fundamental makeup. That's the 
opposite of what Spinoza taught. Just before the break, we looked at the words of Jesus, who blamed bad behavior on the information we choose to put in our brains. Of course, that means there are a lot of subconscious processes going on every time you make a decision. And most of us aren't even close to understanding all the factors at play. But it's also true that we placed a lot of those unconscious influences in our minds through conscious choices. That's why the Bible suggests that you guard the gates of your heart very carefully, that you be careful about what kinds of information you allow yourself to absorb. Because at some point, that information is going to resurface, and it will become an unconscious factor in the decisions you're making in the future. And yeah, it can feel like you're helpless and being driven by uncontrollable instinct, which is why Jesus said in John 8, verse 34, that whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. It's why David said in Psalm 101, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Sometimes it might seem like you don't have a choice, that you're being carried along by forces that are out of your control. But that's because you already made a choice a long time ago. And now you've programmed your brain to do the same thing over and over and over again. So, while determinists say that free will is an illusion, I want to suggest that it's the other way around. Determinism is the illusion. You are not necessarily locked into the life that you have, and you do have the power to make real choices. You can change the programming. That's not to say that everything that happens to you is somehow your fault, because that's also not necessarily true. There are some factors that you didn't choose that shaped who you are today, like the childhood you had or the genetic traits you picked up from your parents. But that doesn't mean you're a helpless puppet the way that some people would suggest. You might not be able to control what happens to you, but you can make meaningful choices about what you're going to do about it. It's right at this point that determinism hits a roadblock when you compare it to reality. If nobody is really making any conscious choices and everything they do is somehow predetermined, well, then there would be no such thing as evil. I mean, if the determinists are right, then Jeffrey Dahmer had no choice when it came to killing and eating those people. We probably just need to accept that. And of course, I have no doubt that Dahmer suffered from environmental influences, that he was somehow a product of his childhood experience. But to suggest that he had no choice but to commit those crimes? Do we really want to believe that? If that was true, would there be any point to punishment ever? If nobody has meaningful choices, how could you hold anybody morally culpable for what they do? Just listen to what it says over in Proverbs 22 and verse 8, because it completely disagrees with the idea that you're helpless. It says, He who sows iniquity will reap sorrow, and the rod of his anger will fail. The book of Hosea suggests that this principle works in two directions, where it says this, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy. Now, instinctively, most of us would agree with that. We reap what we sow. It just seems like human nature 101. But the determinist will tell you that that's just an illusion. You didn't really decide to do right or wrong, and the consequences of your actions are just the laws of the universe. You're nothing but a cog in a great big machine. But then you have to ask, how just would that universe be? Do not be deceived, it says in the book of Galatians. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. The words of this book are permeated with the idea that you really do have the power of choice. Of course, it also says that you and I have a fallen nature, which means that we are predisposed to corrupting influences like selfishness. And that fallen nature that we possess can seem overwhelming sometimes, completely impossible to overcome, as if our actions are completely involuntary. But that's when I suddenly remember the words of Paul, who gives us an important solution, which I'll show you as soon as I come back from this break. 
Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. In the book of Romans, there's a famous passage I'm sure I've read to you before, but in the context of studying free moral agency, I think we should look at it again. Here's what Paul says. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So yeah, there's a law at work in this universe and it's very powerful. You and I often find ourselves powerless to become the person we want to be, to live the life we want to live, and many of us are horrified by the darkness that seems to lurk in our hearts. Our fallen nature seems completely impossible to beat, and so in that regard, I'd have to give Spinoza high marks. There is some kind of force that carries us along determining the choices we make. He called that God or nature, but the Bible calls it sin. And if you have no moral choice at all, then there is no such thing as sin. There is no such thing as holding people accountable, not if they can't help it. But the way the Bible talks about sin, it's not okay. Even though sin is an overwhelming force, a very dark influence on your thinking, there is a way out. Who will deliver me from this body of death, Paul asked. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You might actually be powerless to change who you are, to change the way you think, but I can assure you God is not. Look, I really respect the work of Spinoza, particularly when it comes to his views on the importance of religious and personal liberty. And he was obviously smarter than me. But our day-to-day -day reality screams, no, we are not puppets, and there's got to be something better than this. And that's when we find another view of human nature that actually offers us hope. Spinoza said hope is pointless, and he scoffed the idea that such a thing exists. Why? Because he thought there's no way to change the future. But this book disagrees, and it doesn't just offer hope, it offers an awful lot of it. And personally, I'm still finding every day that as interesting as Spinoza was, and he was interesting, this book appears to be a much closer match for reality. Thanks for joining me this week. I'm Sean Boonstra, and this has been authentic. Mm -hmm.